I'm about to, um, I'm going to share a message, I think, that the Lord gave me this week that has impacted me in a way that it's been a while since a revelation has impacted me that way. Because there was a passage of scripture that I knew that I could quote that you know that you can probably quote that you've probably heard over and over. And because I didn't have deep revelation of it, it has caused a lot of fear and anxiety in my life. I almost feel that I shouldn't say that because I get up here and I preach about not allowing fear or anxiety to exist in your life because, you know, we, we tend to focus on, on things that we do or things that we allow and uh, we make a big deal out of things and sometimes we can find them once or twice in the Bible and then we get to fear and God tells us right at 400 times in the Bible not to fear. Not to fret. So for me to have fear, I know is in um, indirect disobedience to God. But the thing that, here, here's what really got me, the thing that was causing my fear was Scripture. And I'm not talking about healthy fear, the fear of the Lord. I'm talking about keep you up at night, give you panic attacks. Because see, one time... Um, several years ago God gave me a vision of hell that lasted about two seconds and I couldn't have handled three I couldn't have even handled three so I was so thankful that it only lasted two and then my mind goes back to that place very often and I think eternity and I could barely handle two seconds. So I have a fear of hell. And I think that's healthy. I think that's a fear that everyone should have. Because if you don't have a fear of that, you don't have, a, you don't have an understanding of it. And I know there's a lot of theories on what hell is, but let me tell you something. What I experienced for two seconds... I would not wish that. There's never been anybody I've disliked enough that I would wish that on them for one minute, much less eternity. So, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and get into this message. But before I do, I want you to, to make sure that you approach this message seeking revelation from God. Because it's a message that I, I've been tempted to not even minister because of the fact it can be so mis easily misunderstood and made into something that it's not. And we get, we'll get into that. Go ahead, Todd. Does God know you? This was my fear. It, it wasn't that I experienced the revelation of hell. It was the fear of this question right here. Because if the answer to that is no, it brings me back to that, that, that experience that I had. It really, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Here's the passage that I was talking about. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Man. But he who does the will of my Father. That, see, this is in my red letter edition Bible. That's in red. Jesus said that. That wasn't a misinterpretation. That wasn't a misunderstanding or misprint somewhere. This is what Jesus taught. Now, that contradicts popular teaching in most churches. Right? But yet Jesus said this. 
Keep going, Tyler. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, watch who they are. Watch. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done wonders in your name? Go ahead. And then I, Jesus, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You who practice lawlessness. Man, that passage of scripture right there, because it made me question so much. Because, you know, I could be comforted in the teaching, go to the altar, say a prayer, and you're okay forever. I could be comforted in that if I don't read this. But when I read this, I say, hold on a minute. That don't give me comfort anymore. That makes me question some things. That makes me dig a little deeper. So here, I never knew you. Huh. So because of my own lack of revelation of the scripture, I've been tormented by it for years. I've cried many tears and I've spent much time in prayer. But because I recognize from this passage that these people are hell bound. He said, depart from me. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So I recognize where they're going. But what got me is what they said. They called him Lord. 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 And what's his response? Not everyone who calls me Lord. Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And I was like, then, then what? Then what? Then, then who goes, God? Well, that answers the question right there. I never knew you. He has to know me if I'm going to get there. He's got to know who I am. These people have obviously been in ministry. Obviously. Go back, Tyler. We prophesied. We cast out demons. We've done wonders in your name. In your name. We, we used your name, and it worked for us. Not only were they in ministry, they were successful in ministry. Look, they walked in the gifts of the Spirit. Right? They prophesied. So here I am. For a long time saying, God, I've done wonders in your name. I've prophesied. I've cast out demons. I've seen the supernatural. But will you know me? Hey, do you know me? How do I know you know me? I call you Lord, but do you know me? That's been what has tormented me. Does he know me? Because the last thing I ever want to hear from him is depart from me because I never knew you. They obviously knew Jesus. They obviously knew Jesus. But he didn't know them. So my prayer has been for years, not only that I get to know God, but that God will come to know me. But it bothered me because I didn't know if he did. And honestly, that should bother all of us. I make no apology for feeling this way because I think this is one of the greatest revelations that I've ever had. For me, it may not all you that's why I was telling Natalie, this may not seem like a big deal to you, but to me, this was all new.
This was this is like I told Natalie, it's like every scripture that I knew. I see now in a different way. That's what she said. Go back to the ones you think you know. And then say, do I really? And if God don't reveal it to you, my answer to you is no, you really don't. See, there's a huge difference between knowing someone and knowing about someone. So it, it, because of what I read in the scripture, it's obviously, it's obvious that it doesn't matter if I know God. It only really matters if he knows me. Because eternity is a long time. And what I know about God is not going to really matter. It's what God knows about me that's really going to matter. Is Does God know God? me God may know the numbers of the hairs on my head and he does but that don't mean he knows me that just means he knows about me you see he knows the numbers on, on the, every one of our the hairs of every, on, every one of our heads looking around the room some of y'all uh, be easy I know the number on some of y'all. <laughs> but look, although God knows that, does he know you? Because there's a big difference in knowing about and really knowing someone. This week, I was praying one morning and I opened my Bible to start reading and my prayer was, Lord, as I read, reveal your word to me so that I know about you. So that I know more about you. But Father, this is what I pray, and I've prayed this so many times. But Father, show me what I have to do so that you know me. And when I said that, why did God wait till this week? I don't know, because I've prayed that for years. Not that exact, exact thing, but the same theme. And as soon as I did it, I had to put my Bible down. And I was just said, wow. Because he spoke to me immediately. You want to know what he said? Yeah. He said to me, you get to know me through the knowledge of my word. Yeah. He said, but I get to know you through your alignment with my word. Thank you. Now I know the answer to that question. Now I can answer that question, does God know me? It's not always a wonder. It's, it's not always my mind saying, do you know me, God? Do you know me? He does to the degree that I come into alignment with his word. I said, wow. And then it, the scriptures just started popping into my head. And every one of them, I started seeing them in a whole new way. Look, that may not, that may not cause you any great awe, but it did me. It did me. So I know him to the degree that I know his word. He knows me to the degree that I do his word. What did you, how did Jesus start off that passage? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Not everyone who says that I'm their Lord, but the ones who actually make me their Lord. Because I can call him Lord all I want, but if I don't make him the Lord of my life, if he don't call the shots in my life, he's not my Lord at all. It's just a title. All of our knowledge of each other, God and us, can only be through the Word. I can only get to know Him through the Word, but He can only get to know me through the Word. 
Because the word is our only common ground. That's the only place where we can come together. Jesus is the word that became flesh. Now, how do I have access to God? Come on, through Jesus, who is the word. So, wow, wow, I have access to God through Jesus, the word. But God only has access to me through Jesus, the word. It's our only common ground. It's the only place we can get together to meet is the word. It's the only place where we can get together and, and, and get like this, eye to eye. It's in the word. Because outside of the word, I can't know God. Outside of the word, God can't know me. And then everything that I do is for naught. Even though I do it in the name of God. If I'm not in the name of Jesus, I'm not talk, I was talking about our position. If I'm not in that position, in Christ, in alignment with the, the precepts of God, then it's all for nothing. Depart from me. I never knew you. But I did all these things. But I never met you in my word. I never met you in Christ. You were never submitted. You never came into alignment with the word. You never did the will of the Father. So I never got to know you. Wow. Eye-opening to me. Eye-opening to me. As I study the word of God, I get to know God. As I conform to the word of God, God gets to know me. As I study, I get to know him. As I conform, he gets to know me. Because, you know, if I'm a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, What's it matter? What does it matter? Jesus taught a parable about two sons. And the father asked them both to do something. And one said, yes, sir, I'm going to do it right now. But he didn't do it. And the other one said, I don't want to do that. But he ended up doing it. And God said, now who am I happy with? Now the better, the, the, the third scenario would be best. Yes, sir, and do it right now. That would be the best, right? But at least one of them got it done. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he is... The Word made flesh. Jesus said in Matthew 21. It's not the one who calls me, Lord, that make it to heaven, but the ones who make me, Lord, by doing what I say. See, we can call him, Lord, but if we don't make him, Lord, by obedience, he's not Lord. He's not Lord. Don't confuse this. And this is what I was saying earlier. It could easily be confused. Don't confuse this with salvation by works. Because it's not. You're saved by grace. Through faith. In Christ. In Jesus. The Word. You, you see that? Saved by grace. Through faith in Jesus. Right? Right? Who is the Word? But don't tell me you have faith in the Word if you don't do the Word. Because if you don't do it, you don't have faith in it. Agreed? You see how? It's not by my works. It's by my faith. But my faith should cause me to action. Faith without works is dead. See, how it changes the way I see every scripture. Because it all comes back to this. Does God know me? The answer is, if I'm conforming to the word. Does that mean perfection? No. It means conforming. It's a lifelong process. It's, it's our entire life as a Christian. We should be being conformed. And you know, honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes in my life, I take three big giant steps forward. 
and I take five big giant steps backwards? Or I take two steps forward and I take a half a step back? Or you know what? Sometimes I'll take three or four steps backwards then one forward. But I'm not always backing up and I'm sure not always standing still. We got to make progression. We got to be moving. Because you know what? If I'm moving... I've told you all this before from working with horses. If I can just get them to move, I can direct their steps. God said, the steps of the righteous are order of the Lord. God said, just, just, just step, and I'll direct you. I'll change where your foot's going to fall, but you've got to pick it up and put it down. So even sometimes when I start to step back, he said, that's okay. As long as you're stepping, I can get you going in the right direction. We, we're going to regroup on this, and we're going to get going. You with me? We've got to move. We got to move. We got to move. God comes to know us as we conform to the Word. Is it easy? No, not always. We, we've been going through Proverbs on Thursday night. <laughs> and then that ain't easy. We read some of that and, like, nah, nah, I'm not there yet. Bless those who curse you, not today, sometime in my future. Pray for those who spitefully use you. <laughs> yeah, one day. <laughs> one day. <laughs> we could go on and on, but we, yeah, we're not. We're not. We, we're going to stay away from that. But we got to be moving. Look, I may not be there yet, but I'm headed there. You follow me? Does God expect you to be just like Jesus the moment you say, I receive you as my Savior? No. He knows where you are. He knows everything about you. But now, when you accept Jesus as your Savior, what is that? That's the introduction. Then we spend the rest of our life, me and God, trying to learn to know each other. That's just where it begins. That's not the end. That's not the end. That's, that's not the completed work of salvation. That's where it began. That's where we got introduced. Now we spend the rest of our life building a relationship together where I'm getting to know him and he's getting to know me. And am I saying that it's not complete like you wouldn't go to heaven right now? No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's where the relationship started. But now, getting to know him, and he, here, here, then the trick is him getting to know you, that's going to take some doing. The word is our only common ground. I get to know him as he gives me revelation. He gets to know me as I conform to his image. Watch. Let me show you. Remember in the Old Testament we look for pictures, right? God was painting a picture of something that on, on this side of the cross is now the spiritual thing for us. In the Garden of Eden, Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Did God know Adam? Did God know Adam? Okay. Now, there, at that point, there was no need for Jesus, right? Adam and God, were they were in unity. There was no sin. There was no, there was no need for a sacrifice yet. Now, watch. Adam sins. Now, does God still know Adam? How do you know? God comes to the garden and says, Adam, Adam. Where are you? Where are you, Adam? Well, I'm right here. But where are you, Adam? Over here, God. Where, uh, Adam? God didn't know him anymore. God didn't recognize him from anything else out there. Because there was no more common ground. There was no more place where they could meet. There was no more time where they could have intercession with each other. There was no more opportunity for intimacy between Adam and God. None. And then we fast forward when we come to the cross. And then God says, now we got a place where we can meet. Now I've developed a place where we can meet. We're going to have to meet in my word. Outside of my word, it won't work. But I'll meet you right here. We'll get to know each other right here in my word. You come in to alignment with my word, we get to know each other. Does that, does that make sense to you? Don't, don't let this bring any type of confusion. 
let it, let it hammer against the religion in your life. But don't let it confuse your mind. That is where we meet with God in Christ. I challenge you, go through your Bible one day, your New Testament, and start seeing how many times it says, in Jesus, in Christ, in Him, in whom. Do you know that number? Man, I thought for sure you did. But it's a bunch of them. And when you see those in Christ, in Him, in Jesus, in, in whom, all of those, look at the promise attached to it. But where are they all at? In Jesus, in Christ, in Him, in whom? They're in the Word. They're in Jesus. And it has to do with our alignment. It's a position. When I'm positioned in Christ, that promise applies to me. And I can apply that promise to my life. It's where it's all at. That's where everything between me and God are. Because outside of Christ, there is no me and God. It's just me. In Christ, I'm coming into alignment with the precepts of God. Jesus bridged the gap between God and man. He became the central common point where God and man could once again have fellowship. We have to hold on to that truth that Jesus is the Word. He was the Word made flesh. The more revelation of the Word I have, the more I know God. The more I conform to the image of Christ or align with the Word of God, the more God gets to know me. It's our only common ground. I should be hidden in Christ, which means to be conformed to the Word. If I'm going to be hidden in Christ, which is my only hope with God, I have to be conformed to the Word. If I'm going to hide in something, I've got to conform to it. If I'm going to be seated in Christ, which is my position, I've got to conform to the seat. Why, are you, why is your body in the position it is right now? Because you're, you're, you're seated. You conform to the shape or to the image of that chair. So your body took on the image of that chair. If you're going to be seated in Christ Jesus at the right hand of the Father in heavenly place, you've got to conform to the image of Christ. God can only know me through Christ. Therefore, He can only know me to the degree that I've conformed in the image of Christ. You want God to know you better? Conform more to the image of Christ. And the closer you get to the image of Christ, the greater God knows you. Profound to me. But if you think about that when you read the scriptures that you thought you knew, it may change them. It may make you, not change them, but make you see them in a different light, in a greater light, in a, a deeper light. Genesis 24 says, it's a long story. I'm not going to read all of Genesis 20, chapter 24. But it's Abraham, and he sends out a servant to find a bride for his son Isaac. Does that sound familiar? The father is seeking a bride for the son. What's your title? Church. What's your title? Bride of Christ, right? The father, Abraham, sends out a servant seeking a bride for the son. Now, look, look, look how you came to be the bride of Christ. None comes unless the spirit goes out and finds them and then draws them. Right? You see the picture? Now watch, watch. So the servant goes out, and he had prayed to God about, you know, he, how do I know it's her, God? I don't want to bring someone back to my, to my master's son, and, and it'd be the wrong one. How do I know? He said, I'll tell you what. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait by the well. What? Well? Well, what, what's, what's the well for? Speaking of water. So he said, I'm going to wait by the well. 
well, the well was for the water, right? And water represents the Holy Spirit. You, do you see this picture? Okay. He says, I'm going to wait by the well. And when the, when the right woman comes, or when a woman comes, I'm going to ask her for a drink. And if it's the right woman, she's going to give me a drink. But not only that, she's going to offer to give drinks to my, all of my camels, to give a drink to all of my camels. So here comes this young girl. And she goes to draw water. And he says, well, excuse me, ma'am. Can I, can I get a drink? She said, sure, I'll get you a drink. But not only that, when you're done drinking, I'll bring water to all your camels. So he said, oh, here's the right one. So he tells her, you know, I'm, I'm out looking for a bride for my, for my master's son. Well, can I, come, can I come meet with your family? Sure, come back to the house. She meets with the family. And he gives the family a great reward. He didn't just buy her. I, I, well, maybe. He gave them a bunch of gold and other precious things. And then, and then, before he left, he had, he had set up this deal where, well, how will my son know when you find this woman? How will my son know when he sees her coming from afar? How will he know that it's the one you found? Well, look, take this jewelry from the house and put this jewelry on her. So when the son sees the one coming wearing this jewelry, he'll know. So he, he makes this deal, and then he takes a gold ring, and he puts it in the girl's nose. And then he takes the brace, some bracelets, and he puts them on her arm. So the son would know, this is your bride. It's what distinguished her from all the others that marked her as the bride of the son. Do you have a ring in your nose? Have you, have you been identified as the bride of Christ? Well, what's the ring in your nose? How will they know? How will anybody know that you're the bride of Christ? Well, they got to see the ring in your nose. Well, what is it? Let's go ahead. Uh, go to 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Look, we're going to find the ring in your nose. Beloved, let us love one another. For love's a, love is a God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. Go to verse 8. He that does not love does not know God, for God is love. What's the gold ring in your nose? The love of God. What's the first thing people are going to see that identifies you as the bride of Christ? How will Jesus know that's my bride coming? He'll have to see his love. It'll have to be the first thing he sees when he looks at you. Is the love of God in you? Is the love of God in you? What are the bracelets on your arm? What are they? What are the bracelets on your arm? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against the, theirs is no law. How do you get those? How do you get the love of God? Love, uh, love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do you get that? Conforming to the image of Christ. Conforming to the image of Christ. Being conformed to the Word. As you're conformed to the Word you start to take on his attributes. And it's what identifies you as a child of God. So when you stand before Jesus, he'll look at you and say, I know you. Give, come, give me that ring. Let me pull you closer. I see you got my love in your nose. You, you got my joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You're adorned in my attributes. I know you. I know you. But if we stand before him and say, Lord, Lord, who are you? I, I, I don't see my love on you. I don't see my bracelets on your arm. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you've been marked as my bride. I don't even know you. Wow. The love of God is the gold ring in our nose that identifies us to Jesus as his bride. All of the other fruits hinge on love. 
So it's the ring in our nose and it's the first thing he should see. All of these other fruits hinge on love. I can't have any of the other fruits without the love of God being alive and active in my life. So the other fruits are the bracelets on our arm. Because if I can't love myself and others with the love of God, I can't have the joy of the Lord, which is my strength. So I'll live my life as a defeated person because I have no strength. I can't have the peace of God which passes understanding until first I have the love of God. Because you know what? If I don't understand with the love of God that God loves me, I will never have peace. And if I can't love other people with the love of God, I'll never have peace there either. So I can't have the peace that surpasses understanding if I don't understand that my God loves me enough that he's going to get me through any situation I may be in. Without the love of God, the trying of my faith will not produce patience. You ever wonder how that works? Paul said rejoice in all of that stuff. Be glad. Understanding that the trying of your peace produces patience. Our faith produces patience. Well, if the trying of my faith, if my faith is tried and I don't have the love of God, it ain't going to produce patience. It's probably going to produce violence. I'll not be kind to others without the love of God because I always consider myself first. You know anybody that's self-seeking? that puts themselves first. It's me, myself, and my comfort before anybody else or anything else. You know anybody that way? Don't point to them. <laughs> that is not, that is not one of the bracelets that symbolize or, or, or marks us as a bride of Jesus. Without the love of God ruling in my heart and in my life, my life will not produce goodness. I will not be faithful because there again, I'll put myself and my comforts before others, including God. Including God. You ever know anybody that puts themselves and their comfort even before God and what God asks of them and what God desires for their life? I would, God, but I'm not comfortable doing that. Ooh. I will not treat others and their feelings gently because I, without the love of God, I won't care how they feel. Honestly, I, I can say, without the love of God, I don't care how people feel. But with the love of God, I do. This is one of my great struggles when God called me to pastor, it's like, God, how am I going to love people the way you love them when I don't even like them? I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those people who had, they don't come here no more. <laughs> the natural me, I'm not a people person. It could be me and my family, my dog and my horses, and I'm good. I'm good. Got everything I need right here. And if I don't have any contact with the outside world, I'm, I'm okay with that. But that's not what God's called me to. So God had to transform in me love for his people. When I knew I was called to the ministry, I just assumed it was evangelism. Because that's what I would, all right, God, if you want me to minister, I'll be an evangelist. I'll go, I'll tell these people whatever you want me to say to them, and I'll leave, and I'll go to another town, and that pastor can deal with them people. 
I'll just stir up a mess. He can clean it up. I'm going. And I told Natalie, I said, God called me to the ministry. I said, but I'll never be a pastor. She said, good, because I'll never be a pastor's wife. So we came into agreement. Yeah, it was disobedience. That's right. We were not being conformed to his image. And then one day when he started, and we, look, and we did evangelism for a, a, a good while, youth evangelism and stuff, we did that. But when he started transforming my heart and giving me the heart of a pastor, I started becoming scared because it's God. I don't like drama. You follow me? How am I going to deal? I, I don't want to deal with the drama in my life, my own. How am I going to deal with it in the lives of a bunch of others as their pastor? Look, don't take this the wrong way. Don't think that, that, that for some reason that you're bothering me. That's how I thought then. Then God starts changing my heart, and now all of a sudden, I want, I want to be there. I want to help. I, I want to do what I can. I, I want to encourage you. I want to pray with you. I want, you, you see? But the natural me, not so much. But with the love of God. So anything we do, and I'm not talking about just that, I'm talking about we. If we're, if we're the bride of Christ, we should be led. Oh, that, whoa, that changed. You tricked me. We should be led by that ring in our nose. That's his love. So his love should, why do we put a ring in a bull's nose? Because you put that ring in his nose, you can lead that joker anywhere you want him to go. Although he may not want to go there, you can lead him there. So God, when we say, I accept you as my Savior, and, and we really start, conforming to the word he puts that gold ring in our nose and now by his love he can lead us into places that we really don't even want to go you trick me i did not mean to say that nor did i want to because i don't want to be led where i don't want to go <laughs> and i really don't want to do what i don't want to do but nevertheless if i'm led by his love I said it, huh? <laughs> now I've got to live by it. All of the fruits of the Spirit are the nature of Jesus. I cannot say that I'm being conformed to the image of Christ if I'm not being conformed to the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Gentleness. I missed one. So those nine fruits, nine, those nine fruits, if my life's not, I need some of our little kids for Christ ones because they can rattle them off. If my life is not being conformed and I'm not seeing those fruits develop, look, I'm not saying they're ripe yet, but if I'm not seeing them at least develop, I've got to question some things. And I've got, then I've got to start asking, does God even know me? Because obviously I have not been conformed to the word to any degree. I didn't say that they were ripe yet. But they ought to at least be developing in me. I watch fruit produce on my tree every year. And it, it doesn't start out as a great big old yellow satsuma. It starts out as a flower. And then the flower even falls off. And then you got something that looks like, about a, like a BB. And it just, then it just starts to grow. But, but even when it looks right, if you pick it too early, it's sour. It's bitter. I'm, I'm saying this, thinking about the fruit developing your life. Don't get discouraged if it's not sweet. As long as it's developing. As long as it's growing. As long as it, it, it's at some stage and headed to the next one. It may just be at the flowering stage. It may not have even budded yet. But it's developing. You follow me? I'm being very, very metaphorical, aren't I? God's doing that to get around my brain. 
He's navigating around my brain. And maybe yours too, because he's wanting to speak to our spirit. All of the fruits of the Spirit are the nature of Jesus. God know, only knows us to the degree that we take on the nature of Jesus. So what should I do to get the fruit of the Spirit to grow and become mature in my life? Good question. Glad you asked. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. I have learned this from my satsuma tree. If I cut off a branch, it is not going to grow fruit. And whatever fruit there was on it is going to die and fall off. If you don't stay connected to Jesus, you are not going to bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, kindness goodness, faith, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I keep missing that gentleness one. Hmm. Anyway. Those are not going to develop in my life if I don't stay connected to Jesus. That don't mean attach it one day and take it off the next day. It means stay connected. So God creates all this stuff back in Genesis 1.1. And he said they all reproduce according to what? Their own kind. So if God is going to reprodu be reproductive in my life or even productive in my life, I got to stay connected to him because my life is going to produce something and it's going to produce according to whatever it is I'm connected to because I'm just a branch. I'm not a vine. I'm a branch. You're a branch. So whatever branch of, of vine you connect yourself to will determine the fruit that grows in your life. So if you stay connected to Jesus through the word, by a lot, coming into alignment with the Word, well, then you start seeing the fruit of God develop in your life. You start seeing the attributes of Jesus. You start seeing the way Jesus thought, the way Jesus acted, the way Jesus responded, the way Jesus spoke, the way Jesus handled situations. What would Jesus do? Remember those little bracelets back in the 90s? I guess that was in the 90s, maybe the early 2000s. Well, you can answer that question. If you stay connected to the vine. So back to how do I get these fruits developed? Stay connected to the vine. Follow the 49 commands of Christ. Jesus gave us 49 specific ways. He said, you want to be conformed to my image? You want the fruits of the Spirit to be evident in your life? You want the gifts of the Spirit to flow through you? I'm going to give you 49 easy steps. Yeah, forget all about those 10. Let's, let's focus on these 49. We have them. They're back there on the table, right? But we still have some, Miss Cindy? They're, we call them the 49 commands of Christ. Repent, follow me, rejoice, let your light shine. These are all things that Jesus said. And he was saying, this is how you conform to my word. These are the things that I want you to conform to. These are the things that I want you to do. You want to be known by God? Here. Here's how you become known by God. Start letting this, this dictate how you act, how you respond, how you speak, how you think, what you do, where you go. Start following this. Be reconciled. Do not commit adultery. Keep your word. Go the second mile. Love your enemies. Uh, let's mark that one. No, we can't. Be perfect. That just means sincere. Practice secret disciplines, which is faith. Lay up treasures in heaven. Seek God's kingdom. Judge not. Do not cast your pearls before the swine. Ask, seek, and knock. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Choose the narrow way. Beware of false prophets. Pray for laborers of the harvest. Be wise as serpents. Do not fear. Wow. Hear God's voice. Take up my yoke. Honor your parents. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Deny yourself. Despise not the little ones. Go to the offenders. Beware of covetousness. Forgive your offenders. Honor your marriage. Be a servant. 
Be a house of prayer. Ask in faith. Give to the poor. Render to Caesar. That means paying your taxes. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor. Await my return. Take, eat, and drink. Be born again. Keep my commandments. All 49 of them. Watch and pray. Feed my sheep. Baptize my disciples. Receive God's power. And make disciples. Those are the 49 things he told us to do. I challenge you. If you don't have one of these, get one. If you've got one, get another one. Keep it before you. Make this your priority. Make following these 49 things that Jesus told us to do. Make them the goal of your life. If this is how we conduct our life, we're, we are limitless. I want you to be limitless. I want you to be free. I want you to... Where, where are your limits? Don't answer me out loud. Just think about it. Where are your limits? Do you have options? Are you limited by anything? If God says do this, would you have to say I'd like to God, but right now I can't? In, in anything. In anything. Because right now I'm kind of tied down in one way or another. Hey, it could be physically, it could be financially, it could be mentally, it could be whatever. But God doesn't want you that way. If you look through the Bible, you'll find two types of people. Deliverers and captives. And we will be one or the other. God's desire for us is that we're deliverers. He said he came to set the captives free. Are y'all with me? Well, how do I become a deliverer and not a captive? Right here. Right here. We, we, we live according to these precepts. How do I make decisions in my life? How do I know this is, if this is the will of God for me? Right here. When you follow these precepts, you, you know. How, how do I get the gifts of the Spirit to operate in my life? Right here. How do I learn to hear the voice of God? Right here. Almost every question that people ask, the answers are found right here in these 49 things. So I challenge you. Get to, get to know these. Not just a mental ascent. Not a mental ascent. But make them a part of your life. When you start conforming to this, this is the word of God. When you start bringing your life into alignment with these principles, look, they're not rules. They're precepts. They're a code of conduct that if you follow this, God promises you a good, fruitful life. And if you don't, <laughs> come on, baby. Baby needs a new pair of shoes. Nah, not today. They're a, co they're a code of conduct. They're precepts that God has put in place to ensure that we live the quality of life that he wants for us. That's what these are. Not rules to follow. Rules are religion. We're trying to get out of that. I don't, I don't want no rules on me. These aren't rules. They're precepts. And God said you can do them or not. But if you want the life I have planned for you, here's how you live. And you can't live them if you don't know them. And you can't do them if you don't know them. So Natalie's printed them out and made them really easy with the scripture reference and, and one of the, uh, what do you call them? the character traits that it develops in your life. They make great bookmarks, but we go through them. You know, we go through them, and we, and we study them out one after another, after another, after another.
to make sure that we become familiar with them. So then when the opportunity comes to implement one, we make sure we try to do it, all right? I didn't intend to get hung up on that. I wasn't even going to read it. Whatsoever things you ask in my name, that's your position. I'm only in my position as I'm in alignment with the nature of God. This revelation has given me peace about an issue that I used to be very anxious about. I used to be very anxious about that. But now I have peace. Now I have peace because I understand. As I, I understand that as I'm coming into alignment, as I'm growing in the nature of God, God knows me. Man, there's no greater peace than that. To know that God knows me and that one day when I stand before him, I'm, 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 I'm wait, just waiting on a hug saying, finally, finally you're here with me. Not, man, I never knew you. Get on out of here. Get on out of here. God knows me. God knows me. What a relief. What a relief. What's in your life that doesn't look like Jesus? I'm not talking about physically. But what are the things in your life that looks like Je that doesn't look like Jesus? This, this has become the quest of my life. To find the things in me that are not in alignment with the word. And then bring them back into alignment. And this should be the quest of your life as well. That should be the quest of your life. Find the things in yourself that don't come into alignment with the word and align them. Go through that list of 49 things and find out what in your life is out of alignment and then bring it back in. Because without being in alignment, it's not going to go well for you. And I want it to go well for you. Amen?